We're back and, of course, uh, set to take a look at what the papers say this morning. Of course, our guest, uh, J.D. Johnson, is on standby. He's a senior lecturer in the Nigerian Institute of Journalism. J.D. Johnson, good morning to you and thank you very much for your time. Good morning, Kofi, and good morning uh, All right. to our uh, viewers all over the world. We join the British people and the Commonwealth in mourning the death of our Royal Majesty, the Queen of England, Elizabeth. May God grant the family the first to bear the loss, and then we congratulate the, the, the new king, King Charles III, on ascending to the throne of the British monarchy. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right, let's uh, start with a look at the stories on the front page of The Punch this morning. And of course, um, as expected, most of the papers uh, have uh, Her Majesty the Queen's picture on the front page. I mean, she's been on the world stage transcending generations. I remember when uh, my father, my late father, for blessed memory, uh, Mr. Charles Bartels, used to tell me how as a, as a primary school student, he had to draw a portrait uh, uh, of the Queen, uh, you know, a drawing when the Queen visited West Africa when he was a, a kid, you know, so that shows how long she had, she's she been on the throne and uh, she's really, really uh, left her mark on the science of time. Well, the punch in leading story uh, says Queen Elizabeth's death at 96, world leaders pay tributes, Britain mourns, Charles uh, becomes king. More from the punch. Railway pipelines GDP tumbles by 51% over insecurity uh, vandalism. Railway pipelines GDP tumbles by 51% over insecurity vandalism. Pangasan threatens 30-day shutdown. Nigeria risks 1.37 trillion naira loss. Uh, SAC non-performing service chiefs union tells Buhari. SAC non-performing service chiefs union tells Buhari. Uh, PDP pacifies South with BOT Chair Ayu stays. PDP pacifies South with BOT Chair Ayu stays. Um, of course, like I said, we said yesterday, the PDP is really helping the newspapers to sell uh, more copies these days. Military will tackle security challenges, Buhari assures Nigerians. Of course, uh, nothing different from what he, he's been saying from the first day he came into office. Military will tackle security challenges, Buhari assures Nigerians. Uh, more from the punch. UK Prime Minister Buhari, Biden, Obama, Macron, others hail Britain's longest reigning monarch. This is in relation to that story on the Queen. Nigeria's monkeypox death toll, highest in Africa, WHO. Uh, UBA grows half one profit to 85.7 billion Naira. Lagos woman set a place for kidnapping baby dies. Um, police hoodlums demolish 50 Lagos buildings. Victims protest and troops rescue three Chibok girls. Arrest terrorist informant. Uh, stories on the front page of the punch. Moving quickly over to the next newspaper. This time the leadership Friday. And that paper just has a big one giving prominence to the coverage of the Queen's passing, and it says, by Elizabeth II, uh, after 70 years on the throne, Britain's longest serving monarch dies at 96. Britain's longest serving monarch dies at 96. And a quote there uh, from Charles, it says, the death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty, the Queen, is a moment of great sadness or greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. Uh, Charles mourns, uh, mourns as he is named king. Um, uh, Buhari Trust, Biden, other world leaders mourn. British society faces major changes. And the other series on the Queen, the paper says, How the Queen Saved My Life by Prof. Badejo, uh, Life and Times of the Queen. It will, I'm sure, make an interesting read. You can get a copy of the Leadership Friday for more on that. Next up is The Nation, and um, of course, uh, you can see there's a picture on the front page of The Nation of Queen Elizabeth II, as well as others. Uh, but the lead story on the front page, uh, the paper, as it has been doing over the past few days and weeks, indeed, is given coverage to the PDP crisis. Um, any surprises there? <laughs> well, it says, PDP crisis, are you not Jibrin, should resign 
says Wiki. Are you not Jibrin? Should resign, says Wiki. I'm sure in response to uh, the BOT chair stepping down. Uh, PDP neck passes vote of confidence in chairman. I resigned in party's interest, says BOT chair. Uh, Wabara replaces Jibrin. Of course, the party had uh, the BOT chair from the northern part of the country, the chairman of the party from the northern part of the country, the presidential candidate from the northern part of the country. Charles is king of England, uh, says the nation, with a writer to that headline, world leaders mourn Elizabeth II. DSS, military items, cash, financial instruments found in Mamou's home and office. This is a reference uh, to uh, the publisher of the Desert Herald, who also has been acting as negotiator for uh, the kidnapped victims on that Abuja Kaduna bound uh, train. 2023, no option to victory at the motel's APC members. Over 30 aspirants undergo screening for Alafi. UBA grows profit to 88.76 billion Naira in six months. Or some stories on the front page of the nation. Reps summon Pencom DG. Man kills 90 year old father in Quara. Uh, 7,000 donkey genitals intercepted. And seven injured in Ibadan collapsed building. Yet another one, really sad one uh, there. All right, over to the Daily Trust, which is the last paper on our table uh, this morning. Of course, a picture of Queen Elizabeth and uh, the paper giving quite uh, a wide space and wide coverage to this uh, developing story. Queen Elizabeth II, 1926 to 1922. The paper says, uh, writers to that uh, 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 headline, Buhari world leaders pay tributes, life and times of longest seven monarch, her ties with Nigeria, how King Charles III will be unveiled. I'm sure the world it will be really uh, keenly watching how that process will, will be carried out. More from the Daily Trust. Uh, insecurity after clearing operations, FCT schools are ready for resumption. Some good news there. Uh, PDP crisis, neck Passes vote of confidence on IU and DSS recovers military uniforms, huge cash from Mamou's house. And you can see Daily Trust has been giving us uh, coverage of all things north in recent times. And indeed, when Mamou was uh, detained in Egypt, it was Daily Trust who he spoke to, uh, who put out uh, an interview with him. They've been covering this story. So they put that recover uh, in in quotation marks, inverted commas, DSS recovers military uniforms. They put that in inverted commas. Interesting one to watch from Daily Trust. Um, all right, so we go over to our guest. Um, uh, we'll start with uh, the story coming from the United Kingdom, Julie Johnson. Um, you, of course, um, uh, did a short tribute to the Queen, Her Majesty the Queen, Elizabeth II, who passed on yesterday. Just some words from you. Um, what are your thoughts on this development in her life and times? Well, once again, um, join the people of the United Kingdom, the common world and the world um, to mourn one of the greatest icon of the 19th, the 20th and the 21st century. There's no doubt that the Queen shaped global politics, global lifestyle in the 20th and the 21st um, century because she, she was a trans generational figure and a transnational uh, figure. Like you said, she's the longest, she was the longest reigning monarch of the British, of the British Empire, now United um, Kingdom. It's, it was inevitable, if in other sense, they've been rehearsing this particular incident that happened yesterday, since the 60s, uh, which is called, quote, name Operation London Bridge. So, but in any case, nobody really wants anyone. If it's possible, mankind will want everybody to live forever. But there is a death we all owe, uh, which is uh, death, uh, which is inevitable, which all of us is the price of one of us is going to is going to pay. But we must also take solace on the fact that she served her nation until her death. Just Tuesday, she was there to receive. Um, there is the signation of Boris Johnson as the Prime Minister of Britain, as well as uh, accept Liz Truss and invite Liz Truss to inform the government, the government on on our behalf for and become the Prime Minister of the Great of Great Britain. 
So it's it it is sad and at the same time is also a reflective uh, a reflective moment for for all of us and it's also called for us to take lessons. There's a particular story which you read. The Alafa for you has died has died for many many months, and the Shangu of Okumosho has died, and then uh, we have not seen the 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 new king being appointed or being selected. There's a story you read that 128 candidates are going for the screening of the Alafa of Oyo. So I think there is a need for us to tidy up the succession plan of our kings in our, in our, in our part. In our, when you release the selection process, that's when politics comes in. When the queen died, automatically Charles become the king. And if um, in the future, if that happens to Charles too, automatically William will become the king. So I think there are lessons that we need to learn in putting up things in, in proper perspective. For, for for our reality down 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 home uh, what what do you expect going to happen going forward of course um uh, some have said you know this will uh, be another step on the road to phasing out the monarchy in the united kingdom uh, in, in great britain you know uh, when she ascended the throne it was no longer it no longer was called the monarchy they now moved to calling it the royal family and reducing their the presence and activities in official British, British affairs to more of a ceremonial role. Some people feel that uh, with her departure, um, it will have more of the powers and influence of the royal family being taken away. Do you, you expect that this will be reduced? And uh, what kind of king do you think uh, Charles III will be? Well, King Charles has already set the tone for a very long time that is going to tone down the involvement um, of of the monarchy once he ascended the throne. There's no doubt about that. I don't forget that the, the queen, like I said, transgenerational, moved from being the, the, the queen and the emperor of the British Empire. The, what used to be the British Empire used to control a third of the world's um, geographical and territorial landmass. To the point that um, she's just the Queen and the head of government of 15 of Great Britain and 15, 15 nations. So there's no doubt that the, 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 the move towards republicanism, the move towards um, not there have been movement over the years. But one, one thing I would like to let the British people understand is that uh, the monarchy has given them some sort of stability, they have given them some sort of stability to their political system. Look at the what characterized Boris Johnson's um, administration, um, the selection process of selecting the or electing the leader of the Conservative Party, who automatically becomes the Prime Minister to complete the tenure of Boris Johnson. Imagine if there was no monarchy to provide the head of the head of state, which is invariably a ceremony. What would have happened to to the Greek to Greek to United Kingdom? Political political system. I think um, it's important for the British to understand the value of what they have. You don't know what you have until you until you lose until you lose it. That's that's just my my take. They don't have to follow suit with other countries whereby you have um, the, the 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 monarchy was virtually eradicated from 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 their political social. An economic landscape. I think that there's still there's a role for the monarchy in the British system, which makes it to be unique and which makes it to be different. All right, uh, we'll stay. Thank you, Jerry Johnson. The interesting analysis from you. We'll stay with the with the Daily Trust, um, uh, and the front page of Daily Trust. They, of course, uh, with the paper's usual uh, strong presence and coverage of activities in northern Nigeria, they've given us an interesting uh, update on the security situation in Abuja. If you remember, uh, we also have discussed it on this program before. Um, the 
closure of schools in the FCT following uh, the widely publicized, well publicized uh, security breaches in the federal capital territory, Nigeria's uh, uh, capital. Well, what the, the Delhi Trust says to, is that uh, primary and secondary schools in the FCT are set for resumption following uh, intensive clearing operations by the military and criminal uh, hideouts, is what they're saying. Uh, it was learned that the schools would resume on the 12th of September amid excitement by parents and children. You no know, parents are rushing uh, to the schools to take their children home even before the uh, Ministry of Education, the FCT, declared that they should announce that they should be shut down because uh, the terrorists would always, uh, history has shown, target schools uh, you know, as a fertile ground for uh, kidnapping. So what are your thoughts on this? Does this mean, in your opinion, that you know, uh, security in the FCT is back on track? Well, um, there's a there's a related story where some groups or union called for the president to change the, the service chief. The question we need to ask ourselves is that if it has to take this level of security security engagement for for children and school pupils to go to school in Abuja, the federal capital territory, when where you have the seat of government, where you have the presence of all the security uh, agencies head, uh, then it tells you something about the whole security situation in the country. It tells about the whole security situation in the country. And I think that government has not really um, come out with a, 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 a template or a strategy to really solve the security uh, challenges that we have in this, in this, in this country. No matter what assurance um, parents get for, for returning their children to school based on this security cleanup that the agencies of government have done, you will still have it at the back of your mind that anything can happen at any point, at any point in time. There's, there's, there's no assurance that can give you the peace of mind where you have safety of lives and property. And, uh, there is no 100% guarantee of safety of lives and property. Besides that, you 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 recall, um, in most cases, parents and families that have suffered kidnapping and other related matters have had to resort to self help. They've been left alone by government to resolve to resolve their issue to resolve their issue. So, my my advice specifically is to government to make sure that they provide the environment which guarantees the safety, security of life and property. That's the first responsibility, constitutional responsibility of any government to maintain the territorial integrity of the nation and secure lives and property. It's a fundamental function, constitutionally required, that government swore an oath to do, and we can see we have experienced that to a large to a large extent. But our advice parents to still be cautious, to study the environment before they take their children back to school. Because if anything should happen, we have seen that government has left over time has left families to resort to self help in solving their problems that the state should have guaranteed them on. Interesting. Um... Uh, you're saying they should, they should be cautious and <laughs> watch out for a couple of days before, you know, taking their kids back to the schools. Um, let's move on to the nation. I will stay with security uh, matters now uh, in the northern part of the country. Of course, uh, uh, the DSS moving to arrest Tukur Mamo, the publisher of the Desert Herald, uh, who's been negotiating for the release of the kidnapped uh, uh, hostages from that Abuja Kaduna bound train. Um, he was on his way to for the lesser Hajj in, in, in Saudi Arabia uh, on a transit in Egypt. He was detained and then deported uh, to Nigeria. What we're told uh, from the papers this morning, including the nation, is that the DSS is saying that military items, cash and financial instruments uh, were found in his home and office. Um, what are your thoughts on this? So, some people, including myself, have asked, OK, um, why did the authorities wait till he traveled out of the country uh, before? Uh, arresting him. He's been in the country all this while doing what he's been doing. And secondly, is there anything uh, behind this that 
uh, we we do not know that is um, maybe uh, suspicious because he's been saying that uh, he's been under threat from the authorities. But a, a bit of some some of what the nation is saying. They said that the Department of State Services yesterday said its officers found quote incriminating end of quote materials in the home and office of Tukurumamu. Uh, a negotiator for the release of the abducted Kaduna bound train passengers. The paper went on to say Mamu was arrested. Well, we know all that, so let's skip that. Um, spokesman for the service, Peter Funaya, uh, said in a statement that the military uh, accountments large amounts of different currencies and financial transaction instruments were found in his home. What are your thoughts on this, uh, J.D. Johnson? Well, it should come as a surprise to anybody if he is the negotiator on behalf of the um, Abuja train hijack victims, then you should expect to see all of these items that have been found uh, in, his, in, his, in his residence. Like you pointed out, why do we have to wait till now? And then why do we have to wait for him to travel outside of the country before he was invited? I think because you don't have to make too much um, force about about arresting people who naturally would have invited locally to you know the resources of the state that has that has been invested or expended on securing the arrest of someone that moved fully in Nigeria before deciding to go to lesser age and to be arrested in, in, in Egypt. That's one. Then two, I always like the the security agencies and the justice department to do their due diligence first before they start releasing evidence to the to the to to to, to, to the larger to the larger site. This is an investigation still ongoing, and then we now we now have a situation whereby there are information are being provided with respect to. An intelligence that the security agencies and the justice department are getting with respect to solving this particular particular problem. That's my take on it. I don't think there's there, there's a need for a um, quick publication or release of what government is is, is still investigating. Uh, it might be prejudicial. Besides, you are also also might be providing other 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 that are, is other associate. The opportunity for them to to, to 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 disappear. So I'm not I'm not I'm not a security expert. I, I'm not working in the security side, but I'm just talking from a strategic point of view that I think that adopting that particular strategy will not be appropriate in fighting the war on terror. I think it's important for us. Information is power for what you call information in security agencies. Is intelligence. You need to manage the intelligence. You need to gather your intelligence. You need to get all your facts right in order for you to ensure that none of um, none of what you want to do is compromised. Um, this kind of particular approach, in my opinion, I might be wrong, um, might might compromise the investigation and the fight on terror. Uh, while we've heard from you know the the DSS as covered by the Nation uh, newspaper. Uh, the Mamu camp has also been talking. The nation said that they spoke to a staff member of uh, the publication headed by Mamu, which is the Desert Herald, you know, and he said that um, uh, the uh, number of operators, well, I'm heavily armed operators of the DSS who went to his house to conduct a search were 50 in number. Um, that's what he said. Uh, maybe it was a guess, I don't know. But this is what he said, quote, I know they were looking for incriminating materials, uh, they can use to link our boss to terrorism, but I know he is sincere in rendering assistance to the victims of the train attack. The, he said, quote, went on to say, quote, they ransacked the house and cut away documents, phones, and laptops. Those in the house were ordered to sign a document they, de they did not read. There were about 50 who came with uh, sophisticated weapons in Toyota Hilux Highlander uh, as uh, an army vehicles. So so um, this, this uh, show of force, you know, and strength, you know, by the DSS uh, is far from what we've seen as far as the uh, terrorists who have kidnapped these uh, train victims are concerned. You know, there's been no rescue effort. The president has said that uh, the, they have had 
recommendations, but did not want to do anything that would jeopardize the safety of the victims and hostages and lead to collateral damage. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on what the Mamou camp is saying as captured in the nation and also the use of uh, extreme you know, uh, methods, including taking about 50% to search his home, um, as compared to the efforts that have been made and put in to rescue the victims of uh, uh, the kidnapping? I just want us to see this. How would this not compromise um, the rescue effort of, of, of the government? How would this not lead to collateral damage? Um, in the, based on the justification provided for from government for not using force. And then you also wonder, why would they take um, you only see this show of force? Either when you have the chief executive at the state level or federal level is visiting a community or you want to effect an arrest of an individual and then you see um, the whole of the paraphernalia of security agencies being displayed uh, openly and publicly for, for people to see that these agencies are working. I think we should also deploy that in the process of rescuing the victims. And they are trained in in different format. And besides, in security agencies, you also have trained negotiators, people that negotiate on behalf of kidnap victims, on behalf of terror victims uh, across the globe. And I'm sure the agencies of government are responsible for that must have spent, if not millions of dollars in training because if there is one aspect security agencies engage in it's about training of, of their of their personnel. So I think it's important for government to understand that whatever they do creates an impression and that impression has a long long lasting effect. If we could do this just for one individual, why don't we go ahead and do this long time ago to rescue to rescue the victims? Of, of the Abuja train, Abuja train, I, 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 yeah. there is no doubt there will be one or two collateral damage. But at least we have sent a signal and a message that is clear to all the perpetrators of evil against humanity and crime against the state that government will leave no stone unturned to ensure that justice is done, to ensure that the safety of lives and property in our nation is guaranteed. All right, we'll stay with the Nation newspaper. Um, it's uh, a big one, the front page of the Nation. It's a tale of, of three senators. Um, Senator Walid Jibrin, a BOT chairman of the People's Democratic Party. Senator Adolfo Zwabra, former Senate president, who is the new BOT chairman of the People's Democratic Party. And Senator Yochayu, who is a, a party chairman. Uh, that's why I called it a tale of three senators. And what the paper is telling us is that um, the paper has called it a PDP crisis all along. No surprises there. Uh, it's that Wiki is not um, taking the, uh, accepting the resignation of uh, the BOT chair. It says, Are you must go, not Jibrin. What are your thoughts on this? It seems that uh, this. Uh, well, not... You know, you spoke about this, and I said that for the interest of the party, why can't, because the, this. Spotlight has always been on Wiki, but it's not only Wiki that is in the forefront of this of this movement. For the interest of who, for the interest of peace in the party, and if indeed I is a statement, what stops are you from resigning? If he is the clock in the wheel of the progress of having peace and harmony in the party, why is he hell bent in in um, in holding on? To the office. Okay, if they say, okay, let me just put it in this context. Um, um, your children will come to you and say that, you know, the reason why there is an argument between you and mom is because you, um, you, 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 don't, you don't go out, you stay at home all the time, and in the process, because argument that you have to develop a mechanism in, in, in such a way that you have to go out for time and come back home. And the man keep insisting, I'm not going out. Is the man looking for peace in his house? Now, you have been the centerpiece of the argument that there is one, you became the chairman through a consensus arrangement that zoned the chairmanship to the north. And by design, after you have become the chairman, you threw open the presidency. The normal thing is for the 
chairman of the party to be in the north and the presidency to be to be to be to be in the south. So what stops him from resigning if he throws the part of honor, like you said, in the what is the beauty? What does the beauty do? The beauty is just an advisory, it's an advisory, an advisory body that does not have an executive power. Is the chairman, is the national executive committee of the party that has executive power. The chairman of the BOT is just an advisory, advisory, advisory body. So I think if Ayun is indeed a man of dignity and is interested in his, in his party's success at the poll, except there's something that the ordinary eye cannot see. Why is he holding on to? We saw the commissioner for, for uh, the commissioner that resigned in Lagos State as a result of building collapsing in, in, in Lagos State. In one of the stories um, you, you had before we, we, we come to this segment of, of the press. So why can't he? That's the question I keep asking. Because the narrative has always been, no, oh, wiki, 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 wiki. And you had what the governor of Ogun State said, you have what the governor of, um, of Abia, Ikiazu, said, and you have had what the governor of Benway State has said over time. So why is it, why is it not charitable for Nigerians to do the part of honor in bringing about peace? All right, but the paper is telling us that the, the, um, uh, the National um, Executive Council of the PDP has... Uh, uh, had passed a vote of confidence in Ayu. What else can we can do? I mean, if, they, if they, any neck of the party says we're passing a vote of confidence in you, Ayu, believe that you are the man for the job and you deserve to remain on this seat. I think, wouldn't you say that is the, that is the end of the story, like we say, in this part of the world? Kofi, if you know the power and the fleece and the, the pets of the office of the national chairman, you understand. All the money, no, number one, the account is not audited. Look at the amount of money these parties have collected as nomination for. That money is sitting in the bank now. It runs into billion. You recall that when APC, when Adam Sushima was the first APC chairman, and uh, the governor of UB State, Marboni, was made the chairman of the Katika Historical Committee. You know, it that to take the intervention of the president for them to conduct the national convention. You know how many times it was postponed? How many times it was postponed? Now, you are not talking about the situation whereby the National Executive Committee is sitting on tons of money collected as nomination, as nomination fee from aspirants across the left and breadth. Of, why should the National Executive why should the national arm of the party be collecting the nomination form for gubernatorial aspirant? Why should they collect for House of Assembly aspirant? That type of resource should be domiciled at the state. Why the one for National Assembly and the president should go to, 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 to Abuja? But we have a flawed, a flawed system uh, in, 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 in our country. They will be speaking of average federalism at, at, at governance level, but at the party level, you have unitary structure at the party level where everything resides with the national chairman who acts as an emperor. You recall about two days ago, the some members, the southern members of the national exec, of the national working committee of the party stayed a workout, and today they are passing they are passing a vote a vote of confidence on him. For me, I think that if I you really loves that their party, and if he really loves the presidential candidate of their party and is interested in their winning direction, there is nothing stopping him from doing the, the part of honor by stepping down. Indeed, uh, it's, uh, I think it's important you, you reminded us that the uh, National Working Committee, the Southern National Working Committee members uh, are staged to walk out and uh, uh, insisted on, on IU's um, resignation. Interesting times. And uh, we we'll watch to see what happens in the People's Democratic Party, which is one time the largest party in Africa, which was meant to be in power for 60 years. Whatever happened uh, to that dream? Let's move over to the punch in Ethiopia. Um, I think a very important 
issue that needs uh, coverage. And I'm, I'm happy the paper has given some you know, attention to this. Monkeypox, monkeypox. It's uh, been you know, circulating around the world and Africa has not been left out. And uh, it's been an issue in other parts of the world. You know, I mean, they've been running scared about this you know, after we've, we're still grappling with COVID. Indeed, I told a friend of mine, you know, I put up one of the headlines, uh, the, the screenshots of one of the paper front pages on my WhatsApp status, and a friend in Kenya uh, was scared when they saw the statistics of monkeypox um, from Nigeria and said, uh, are we safe? And I said, well, we don't, we're not even, even leaving. Like, there's something on ground in the country. I don't know what you think about that, that situation. But what the World Health Organization is saying, as uh, you know, covered by the Punch newspaper, is that Nigeria's monkeypox death toll is the highest in Africa. Uh, they said this yesterday. Um, it's a, the highest death toll and confirmed cases. Not just death toll, but confirmed cases, if you read uh, the details there. Um, are we giving this the priority attention it deserves? You know, for the WB, WHO report um, and the newspapers highlighting it in their, in, their, in their major stories, I'm not too sure that the government or the people are aware or have placed this particular issue in the front corner of their concerns with their safety and health in the country. There's, there's, there's no doubt that if you put the population of Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis other countries in Africa, that the statistics of Nigeria will definitely amplify um, the rate of whatever you're talking about in, 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 in Africa. There's no doubt that there's a need for government to pay, to pay serious attention to this. And it's also important for us as, as citizens to also pay attention to issue that, issues that has to do with our health and um, um, in order for us to know what we, steps that we need to do. I think this is a call out to the Ministry of Information and Ministry of Health um, to come up with a protocol on what Nigerians need to do with respect to this, to this outbreak um, before it turns out to be a major a pandemic like um, like COVID that we are still grappling with and that the effect will still be with us for the next 100 years because yes, COVID totally shut down the society in almost on more than 100 years. It also disrupted the economy, the major disruption of, of COVID. I'm not too sure that all society or all family or all major business interests have recovered from it, and we must, once beating twice shy, government must come up with protocol on educating the people with respect to this particular disease, and also telling us on what steps to take to ensure that we do not, we do not facilitate the spread of this particular um, disease. Jimmy Johnson, still with the, with the punch, I think this would be of uh, great interest to you as it is uh, of interest, uh, the pressing issue to Nigerians, the issue of oil theft. Um, the um, uh, Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association, Pangasa, the, the punch says, um, is threatening a 30-day shutdown over uh, uh, oil theft in the Niger Delta, believe it or not, over oil theft in Niger Delta. And so they are threatening to shut down the oil and gas sector in the entire country. That this will mean that, um, I mean, even down to those of us at the, um, the downstream end, those at the retail sector, we uh, end, we cannot buy petrol or diesel from the stations or even kerosene. Now, we're hearing that the paper is reporting the members of Pengasan staged protests in various parts of the country, including uh, Abuja, Wari, uh, and of course, uh, Port Harcourt and Kaduna. It's a key cities where you have refineries. Um, you know, they're also saying that uh, uh, findings by their correspondent uh, showed that uh, should the workers implement their threat, Nigeria might lose about 1.37 trillion naira from the non-production and sale of crude oil, a foreign major exchange revenue earner in the country in these times. So, um, I mean, the issue of, uh, of oil theft has been, has been on for years, you know, and like I said, we said yesterday, bunkering is a term we're used to in this country. Are you, are you surprised um, that, that Pengasan is organizing protests around the country and threatening to shut down the oil and gas sector in the country because of oil theft in the Niger Delta? I don't, I don't know. In the course of this week, I read a particular
Glory Report that said that over 300,000 barrels of Nigerian crude uh, are stolen daily, which amounts to, I think, um, one, is it $1 billion or I don't know how it was stated, or $1 billion. Naira. Um, my take on this is these oil and gas workers, oil theft cannot be possible if members of this union are not participating in it. It's absolutely impossible. Down the line, we have some of the members of these various associations being involved in this nefarious crime against humanity, crime against the state. What steps have they taken to ensure that within their members, they have a, a code of conduct and ethical practice that ensures that none of their members will participate in the theft of Nigerian uh, economic, uh, national treasure. That's that's my that's my take on this particular one. You know, there was this um, crossfire between the NNPC, NNPC, and the chairman of the custom boards. Yeah, go go on, Gideon. We we can see you. We can see you. I think we had a momentary uh, freeze in, in in the video signal feed there. But I'm sure you're referring to the um, the daily consumption figures. Where well, I mean, Ali said, you said we're consuming 60 million barrels of crude per day, but you are releasing 98 million barrels of crude per day. Why? I guess that's what you're referring to. Okay, we seem to be having a bit of a network challenge with Jerry Johnson. Uh, it happens from time to time, and uh, uh, we apologize for that. Uh, Jerry Johnson, if you can hear me. Okay. Uh, we definitely cannot hear him. All right, uh, we will. All right, we'll, we'll just call it a day right now um, on the breakfast. And of course, uh, we'll say thank you to Jilly Johnson, who has given us a very interesting analysis on some of the headlines on the front pages of today's National Daily. So we have um, a brief wrap of what happened today in history, uh, being the ninth day in the ninth month of 2022. We'll be right back with the first major conversation on The Breakfast. Please stay with us.